Hello and welcome. I'm Marsha Mott, the coordinator for UF Health Wellness University. Thank you for joining us tonight as we discuss a proactive approach to pregnancy. I'd like you to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Stan Williams. Dr. Williams is a professor at the University of Florida Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology in the Division of Reproductive Medicine. He is board certified in obstetrics and gynecology, reproductive endocrinology, and infertility. Dr. Williams joined the University of Florida College of Medicine in 1988 after serving in the United States Air Force, and he has been active in improving infertility services. He provides clinical services, conducts research and hormonal actions, and on the prevention of post-operative, excuse me, scar tissue. Dr. William teaches at the University of Florida and teaches medical students, OBGYN residents, as well as OBGYN practitioners in Florida about the latest advances in endocrinology, infertility, and advances in laparoscopic surgery. If you have any questions for Dr. Williams, you could submit written questions at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. At the end of the presentation, I will read your question anonymously. We will only be accepting written questions tonight, and I'm going to try to get through as many questions as possible. Dr. Williams, I'm about ready to turn it over to you now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marcia, and thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us uh, this evening. Hopefully, you're having a wonderful uh, week so far. I'm going to get started here. Um, as Marcia said, uh, we're going to talk uh, tonight about sort of two different topics. Uh, about trying to get pregnant, you know, what should you be, you be thinking about, uh, what should you make sure that you've done, and if you've uh, been trying for a while, uh, what are some possibilities of, of what might be going on? So if I can get my slides to advance, there we go. Um, these are the topics we're going to cover uh, for the first part, and getting ready to become pregnant. Uh, we're gonna look at uh, lifestyle and how that might affect uh, your chances for pregnancy, diet and weight, vitamins and supplements, what should you take, what shouldn't you take, uh, medications, what effect might they have on a uh, planned pregnancy, uh, vaccinations uh, you should have, uh, and infections you want to avoid. Uh, and consideration for genetic testing before you're even pregnant. Uh, and finally, uh, we'll close this part of the talk with uh, the effects of both uh, mother and father's uh, age and how they might affect fertility. So first of all, lifestyle. Um, hopefully everyone should know that smoking is bad for a lot of things, but uh, it is also very bad when you're trying to conceive. Uh, so uh, whether it's the woman who is smoking or the man who is smoking, the smoking itself can have deleterious effects on egg or sperm. So you both definitely want to quit if you are current smokers uh, and uh, that will enhance your fertility uh, several months hence. Similarly, uh, alcohol particularly in the woman, in months that she's trying to conceive, uh, the data is pretty clear that you will reduce your chance of conception in a given month if you drink any alcohol during that month. Now, obviously we should know that uh, alcohol during pregnancy is bad for the baby, but it also has deleterious effects on the egg that's actually trying to uh, develop and ovulate uh, so uh, for the woman, no alcohol at all. For the male, certainly no more than uh, very modest uh, alcohol intake. Uh, so it doesn't have any effect on uh, sperm. Caffeine is a little bit of an open-ended question. Research sort of goes back and forth about the effects of this. Uh, but I think that if you uh, moderate your caffeine intake to no more than the equivalent of two cups of coffee a day. And, and I'm not talking about the 20 ounce cups. I'm talking about the traditional, maybe eight, 10 ounce uh, cups of coffee that I, I don't think that that's gonna have any significant effect on uh, conception. Stress is a difficult one to talk about. Um, certainly if your stress level is extremely high in women 
it can get so high that you actually stop ovulating regularly. So your periods would, be, would become irregular. But even moderate amounts of stress uh, that most of ex, uh, experience in, in the average uh, life uh, of everyone uh, can have effects on uh, time to conception. So whatever you can do to reduce your stress level, both at home and at work, uh, that will uh, enhance your ability to conceive sooner rather than later. Exercise, very important for everyone to get uh, good exercise, but you don't want to overdo it. Uh, women that are trying to conceive, you certainly don't want to be tra training for the next marathon uh, or that type of uh, exercise, but you do want to maintain your moderate exercise that you're used to doing. So ultimately the goal is to have a pregnancy and deliver that baby uh, and it's not called labor for nothing. It really does take uh, a lot of uh, activity uh, to deliver that baby. And the better shape that you're in when you go into labor, uh, the easier time you will have uh, successfully navigating la uh, labor. Uh, for men, uh, sperm production is very temperature sensitive. So men want to avoid excessive heat to the testis and scrotum. And so they definitely want to avoid sitting in hot tubs, uh, saunas, uh, even ex excessive bicycling uh, can hold up uh, the testis to close to the body and, and raise their core temperature. And in Florida, particularly in the summer, men need to be very careful uh, to avoid strenuous exercise outdoors, you know, try to get uh, a lot of their exercise uh, indoors where uh, it's uh, air conditioned. Uh, they're actually, studies that show men's sperm counts do drop in the summer heat. So uh, try to maximize that if you can. Next, uh, everyone's favorite topic, uh, diet and weight. Uh, everyone uh, should know that the ideal body weight, uh, uh, the BMI is 19 to 25. Now BMI is simply a calculation. You can look this up if you don't know what your own BMI is. Uh, just go on the internet. Uh, it's, it's just takes into account your height and your weight, and it gives you a calculation uh, of BMI. Anything over 25 is considered uh, overweight. Over 30 is actually considered obese. And as you gain weight, particularly over 30, and it accelerates over 35, uh, obesity can uh, reduce fertility uh, and Obesity, particularly over 40, BMI of 40, uh, can uh, increase pregnancy complications and even increase birth defects uh, in the offspring. So for multiple reasons, try to get your BMI uh, certainly less than 35, uh, ideally less than 30 to sort of optimize uh, your chances of pregnancy. Also, while you're trying to get pregnant, and certainly while you are pregnant, you want to limit your mercury exposure uh, by limiting consumption of oily fish. Now, that includes uh, tuna, swordfish, mackerel, uh, those types of things. The flaky white fish uh, typically does not store mercury, uh, and so that's, that's much safer to consume uh, as much as you want. Uh, but just uh, sort of limit uh, your consumption uh, probably no more than one uh, serving a week uh, of some oily fishes. Lead exposure, uh, I think we're all aware that uh, in Flint, Michigan, in the last few years, there was a major crisis uh, for lead in the water. Fortunately, that's not true uh, for the vast majority of muni municipalities. But, you know, if you're renovating an old house, there may be lead paints that you're scraping and getting in the air. You need to be very careful about that. Uh, if you have bought uh, crockery uh, outside the country, a lot of that crockery is actually made from clay that contains lead, so you don't want to be cooking in that. And even foreign produced medications and foreign produced supplements can be contaminated with lead, so you just need to be very careful. Uh, and uh, for those of you who like vitamins, we'll get to that in a minute, be sure you absolutely do not exceed uh, 10,000 units a day of vitamin A. Vitamin A in very high doses can definitely cause birth defects. So you don't wanna overdo that. 
Uh, turning our attention to vitamins, uh, everyone that's attempting pregnancy should definitely be taking folic acid at 400 micrograms a day. And if you just buy any over-the-counter multivitamin, that's going to have that requirement of folic acid in it. You don't need special prenatal vitamins. Uh, any standard multivitamin uh, this day and age uh, should have uh, the, the necessary folic acid. <clears throat> you also probably want to avoid herbal and hormonal supplements. A lot of herbs uh, have hormonal properties that are not poorly studied and they could impact uh, your ability to conceive. Uh, it's not for sure, uh, but why take a chance? There certainly is no evidence that any herbal preparation, even those the ones that are marketed for uh, helping fertility, there's no medical evidence that they truly uh, enhance your fertility. So save your money and uh, be safe. Uh, in your multivitamin, uh, you might want to include iron in, in your multivitamin if you know you're uh, anemic or have been anemic in the past, or if you have very heavy periods, which is going to lead to anemia. Uh, now, iron can be constipating, so you might want to combine that with a stool softener uh, just so that you don't have that side effect. Other medications uh, for prescriptions, the rule of thumb is only take prescription medications that you really absolutely need during pregnancy because the majority of medications have not been tested to see if they are safe in pregnancy. Most of the pregnancy data comes uh, through just periodic reports that, oh, this patient was taking medication X and she had this outcome. And, enough, and if enough of those reports surface, then we might say, well, medication X causes that outcome. But they truly, the drug companies do not want to spend the money to test them in pregnancy. So it's an unknown risk uh, for the most part. <clears throat> Tell your prescribing doctor that you are trying to get pregnant and make sure the medications that you need to take uh, are uh, the safest ones possible uh, there are definitely some medications that we know uh, are harmful during pregnancy. For men, uh, in recent years, I've seen uh, a lot of men being placed on testosterone supplements because of, quote, low T. Uh, now, it does make men feel better uh, when they have higher testosterone levels, but unfortunately, testosterone supplements will turn off sperm production. We see men regularly who are on testosterone supplements and you check their sperm count and they've got very low or even absent sperm counts. So no men should be taking testosterone or anabolic steroids uh, for bodybuilders uh, because it, it will definitely have an effect on sperm production. As far as vaccinations, uh, everyone probably has been uh, vaccinated uh, in the childhood uh, for rubella, German measles, and chicken pox or varicella, but not everyone uh, is immune to those even after, after immunization. And certainly for rubella, you probably should have your immune status checked to make sure you don't need to be revaccinated. Now, if you do need to be revaccinated with either rubella or uh, the chicken pox vaccine, you need to wait a minimum of, of one month, and some people would suggest three months because that is a live attenuated virus. And there are reports that that virus has affected a very early pregnancy. So those are the only two vaccines currently that have a live virus. All the other vaccines uh, essentially uh, use a different technology. Hepatitis B, uh, everyone should be uh, vaccinated against hepatitis B. That's not something that you want to catch. Uh, and so just make sure your uh, doctor has you up to date on your hepatitis B vaccinations. Tetanus, diphtheria, pertussis. Uh, it comes in a combined vaccination called, called Tdap. And it's recommended that you have this every 10 years. You really just need the tetanus every 10 years and the pertussis probably at, later in life. But since it comes in this uh, combined preparation, it's, it's very easy to ask your doctor about uh, getting a Tdap uh, every 10 years. 
Uh, that's even a vaccination that's routinely given uh, in the third trimester of pregnancy so that the uh, antibodies actually flow to the baby and the baby has some protection until they can make their own antibodies. Flu shots, everyone should get a flu shot annually and particularly pregnant women are encouraged to get flu shots annually. Uh, this is not a live virus, uh, it is very safe and actually we want pregnant women and if you're trying to get pregnant, you're included in that category to get your annual flu shot. Now, one hot question now is, well, what about the COVID-19 vaccine? If I have access to that vaccine, should I be taking it if I'm trying to get pregnant or even if I am pregnant? And uh, all of our parent societies, the American College of OBGYN, uh, my infertility society, which is called the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, actually just put out, out a statement today. Uh, they are encouraging people to receive this vaccine. We know what devastation the disease can cause. Uh, and the vaccines that are out there are not live viruses. And so there's not even a theoretical uh, risk that it could affect your pregnancy. And we know the benefit uh, that, it, that uh, taking the vaccine uh, can have. So I would encourage you, uh, if you are able to get the vaccine, get vaccinated. Now, when you are pregnant, you do want to avoid uh, several infections. One is called toxoplasmosis or toxo, uh, and this is something that cats carry. And so if you have a cat in your household, be very careful changing the litter box. And uh, if you have to change the litter box, or even after you pet your cat, uh, wash your hands really well. CMV or cytomegalovirus is very prevalent in uh, daycare and healthcare workers. And again, hand washing is, uh, is the trick there. Uh, just uh, be very tedious uh, in hand washing to avoid getting an active CMV infection while you are pregnant. Zika, uh, everyone remembers that from a few years ago. That's transmitted by mosquitoes in tropical areas. And yes, Florida is a subtropical subtrop area. Uh, and even though it's uh, not high on the list of things to worry about currently, uh, when, the, when the summer rolls around, you know, just avoid uh, areas that have heavy mosquito populations uh, and try to avoid uh, mosquito bites if, if you can. Preconception genetic counseling. Everyone should consider getting screened to see if they carry the gene for cystic fibrosis. It's a very highly prevalent gene. And so if you and your partner both carry the gene for cystic fibrosis, you've got a 25% chance you're going to have a child with the disease. And it can be a devastating disease. Very similarly, something you might not have heard of is spinal muscular atrophy or SMA also highly prevalent in the population. Uh, and again, if you and your par partner uh, carry this gene, you got a 25% chance that your child will have it. And it, it's a horrific disease. So you definitely want to be screened uh, for those carrier status uh, levels. If you're African American, sickle cell carriers need to be screened. <clears throat> and those of South Asian descent and Mediterranean consent descent uh, can have other hemoglobinopathies. They're called thalassemias, uh, and you can pass that on to your child. So all these are discussions with your uh, gynecologist or your primary care physician about getting screened for those. People that have a family history of mental retardation uh, in uh, first cousins or aunts, uncles, uh, etc., cetera, uh, the most inherited the most common inherited condition that causes mental retardation is called fragile X. And even though you may not be affected, uh, this gene can amplify in your offspring and you can have an affected offspring if you uh, sort of carry a partially expanded portion of this gene. So again, you might need to be screened for fragile X. If you are of Jewish descent, Tay-Sachs and a host of other conditions probably should be screened as well. 
The third topic on the screen there is expanded carrier screening. So we know of at least a thousand genes that we carry that have been reported to cause disease in offspring. Uh, and most of us have no family history of it because they're recessive genes. But if both you and your partner happen to carry one of these genes, you can have an affected child. There are companies out there that now will uh, offer what's called expanded carrier screening. So with a simple blood test, these companies will screen you for approximately 250 genetic conditions, both you and your partner, to see if you are at risk for having a child with some genetic condition. Uh, so it's something to consider and, and talk about and uh, think about, do you want to get screened or not? Now we're moving on to maternal and paternal age and the effect it might have on fertility. Uh, the graph here shows in the red line that as women naturally get older, fertility drops. So uh, you can see in this line that starting at age 30, start, women start losing fertility and it accelerates after 35. The other two things that, that worsen with advanced maternal age is an increased risk of having a miscarriage and an increased risk of having a baby with a chromosomal conditions like Down syndrome or a, another similar chromosomal condition. Women are born with all of the eggs they will ever produce. So when a woman is 35 years old, her eggs are 35 years old. They've been sitting in suspended animation in the ovaries for 35 years and many of them have picked up defects to their chromosomes during those 35 years. And that defect gets passed on with the egg. And that's what reduces the chance of fertility and increases the risk of miscarriage and having a child with a chromosomal uh, defect. Now, a concept you might hear of is called ovarian reserve. This is sort of a uh, looking at that maternal age issue uh, in a little bit more detail. So it just means how likely are you to have a healthy baby using your own eggs? And so as we looked at in that first slide, age is the most important factor in determining somebody's ov ovarian reserve. Um, it doesn't matter, all these other tests we'll talk about in a second. Uh, if you're 38, 40 years old, you are 38, 40 years old. Nothing will make you 28 again, I'm afraid. But uh, you can uh, look at your age. Have your eggs biologically aged faster than other women your age? And so you can do additional tests for the ovarian reserve. So additional testing can be performed, particularly in women over 35, women who uh, have had fertility drugs in the past and did not stimulate very well, women who have been exposed to chemotherapy or radiation therapy to the ovaries in the past, or women who even had ovarian surgery for an ovarian cyst, uh, for example, in the past. All of these things can damage uh, the eggs that are in the ovary. So probably one of the most important tests for ovarian reserve is this hormone called AMH, anti-mullerian hormone. So this is a simple blood test. You can draw it anytime during the menstrual cycle and it will give you additional information over and above uh, your age. You can even do uh, additional testing early in the menstrual cycle on day two, three, or four. Uh, you can have a vaginal ultrasound. Here's a picture uh, over here on the right showing uh, an ovary with this vaginal ultrasound and we can count how many eggs are developing uh, that month. Each one of these little black holes here is a follicle, a fluid filled space that's got an egg trying to develop uh, to, to ovulate that month. And when you count those antral follicles, that's another measure of ovarian reserve. Uh, you can also measure uh, on day two, three or four, your FSH hormone and your estrogen hormone uh, and they will also contribute to this picture of uh, what is my ovarian reserve and uh, am I losing my fertility faster than other people my age. 
turning to the uh, male side of things, advanced paternal age. In general, uh, men, uh, their age has much less impact uh, on their fertility than women. But when men are in the 40 to 50 year uh, range or above, they're considered to be advanced paternal age. Uh, and there is some evidence, as, um, it's still sort of developing evidence. Uh, let me go back. Uh, that men who uh, father offspring, uh, they have an increased risk of uh, their children having gene disorders. These are spontaneous mutations. They don't carry the disease, but their sperm developed a gene uh, mutation. They have uh, children with an enhanced uh, risk of schizophrenia, autism, some childhood cancers like leukemia, and an increased risk that their uh, wife uh, may miscarry. So uh, just risk to be aware of. Uh, again, uh, you can't do anything uh, about it, but you should be uh, aware of it. Now, this uh, is something that uh, I would hope that most people would understand, but unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of misinformation about how long does it really take uh, people to get pregnant. Uh, and so <clears throat> if you took 100 couples and you said, everyone stop using contraception today and let's plot to see how fast uh, people get pregnant, this is a graph that shows uh, the rate at which uh, couples conceive. Now, if you just average this part, first part of the curve here, uh, a figure that uh, I quote to my patients is that it is normal uh, to have about a 15% chance of conception in each month uh, that you're not practicing contraception. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean you're trying to get pregnant, but if you're not using contraception and you have regular sexual activity, the sperm and the egg do not know if you are trying or not. So that is an unprotected month. And so that month you've got a 15% chance of conception. So that's what mother nature gives us. Uh, it's not 50% like a lot of people think it is. It's only 15% per month. Uh, and that's in this early, you know, first six months of this curve here. Now, if you have had unprotected intercourse for a year, uh, if you're uh, less than 35 years old and you're female, or six months of unprotected intercourse, uh, if you're over 35 and you have not conceived, then just by definition, it means that you're infertile. It means you're having a hard time conceiving. It doesn't mean that you'll never conceive. It just means that uh, uh, you might wanna seek uh, a physician to get some advice and some testing to see what can be going on uh, and what can be fixed if there is anything uh, uh, going on. Incidence of infertility is very common. Up to 15% of couples, one out of eight couples will experience troubles conceiving uh, during their lifetime. Uh, so it's a very common, a lot of people uh, don't talk about it, so your neighbors may not have talked about their infertility experience, but they went through infertility. Now, with optimal testing and optimal treatment, uh, in most couples, we can achieve uh, 70 to 90 percent success rates, uh, but unfortunately, that's uh, with unlimited uh, therapy uh, and then finances and psychological distress of going through infertility therapy uh, comes to bear. Uh, and so many couples uh, really uh, don't hit this 70 to 90% success rate uh, just because they've run out of financial resources or their own emotional resources. So if you're having problems conceiving, you know, what, what could be going on? So these are statistics from infertile couples. Almost half of the time, the issue is with the sperm count. So this is not just a female issue, this is a couple issue. So male factor, 40%. Problems with ovulating regularly, 20 to 30% of couples. Uh, tubal blockages, we'll talk more about these uh, uh, in subsequent slides, but tubal blockages in 20 to 30% of infertile couples. 
cervical factors, that's where cervical mucus is. So there can be mucus problems. There can be antibodies against sperm, a variety of things, but we, label, we lump them all under the cervical factor. And then endometriosis is a disease uh, that uh, you may be aware of that causes pain in some women, but in some women, they have no pain at all, but they experience infertility. Uh, and obviously, if you're a mathematician, this adds up to a lot more than 100%. And that's very important. Many couples have more than one cause of their infertility, and all of them need to be uncovered uh, and treated to, to achieve maximal uh, results. So first of all, let's look at the sperm count. What do we do when we do a sperm count? Uh, so one word of caution, you definitely want uh, your male partner to get a sperm count uh, at, in an infertility clinic setting. Uh, I do know that Quest and LabCorp produce sperm counts, uh, but the sperm counts that they do uh, are of questionable value because number one, they do not have local labs for the most part. Uh, and after about 30 minutes, the sperm uh, begin dying uh, and the counts start looking abnormal. So you wanna have uh, a laboratory that's local and that has experience uh, in doing these. Uh, it takes a very highly trained technician to do a, uh, an adequate sperm count. Normal things that we look for, what's the volume of the ejaculate? It should be about one and a half to five uh, mLs. That's about a teaspoon. Uh, concentration should be over 15 million per mL. So uh, the technician is uh, counting, not 15 million of them, but they have a special way of counting and calculating. Uh, and so we should have 15 million sperm per mL, or uh, that's a low sperm count. Of the ones that they count, how many of them are actually making progressive motility? So how many are, are moving straight ahead versus uh, just, uh, just sitting there and wagging their tail and not really making any forward progress. That should be over 32% of sperm. And then how many sperm are actually shaped perfectly? So here's a perfectly shaped sperm and it only takes 4%, uh, but with sperm production, a very high number of sperm will be abnormally shaped. And it's not that these sperm create uh, birth defects, uh, but they're just very uh, unable to deliver their package of chromosomes effectively to the egg. So they have a very low likelihood of penetrating an egg. Now, unfortunately, in most men with low sperm counts or, or abnormalities in these parameters, there isn't medication that's gonna correct that. Uh, and so infertility clinics just have to use the sperm that's being produced and do special techniques. And we'll talk more about this in a minute. Uh, called intrauterine inseminations, uh, if there is only a moderate reduction of sperm parameters, or if there's a severe reduction of sperm parameters, it may mean going straight to in vitro fertilization. So ovulation, very critical. A woman has to release an egg uh, on a regular basis. And a very large tip here is just your menstrual history. If you're having regular cycles every 25 to 35 days, 95% chance you have regular ovulation and uh, you're not having a problem uh, with that. Uh, three basic ways to check ovulation in people that are having regular cycles. One is the basal body temperature. It's kind of frustrating to keep uh, these graphs very long and they're very, they can be very difficult to interpret uh, but you, you plot these and you're seeing a, a graph like this uh, on the curve. You're looking for this upswing. Uh, very cheap, but very difficult to interpret. So that's not our favorite test. A very simple test is you go to the drugstore and you can buy these over-the-counter uh, over ovulation predictor kits. Uh, they're detecting the hormone LH in your urine. And they're actually very good. Um, when you get a positive response, they are about 90 to 95% accurate. And if you're not getting a positive response, again, that's probably 90, 95% accurate. So these are actually very good uh, kits that you can find in the drugstore. Uh, and then uh, in infertility world, uh, a single blood test to measure this hormone progesterone, which is only made after you ovulate, 
is really uh, sort of the gold standard uh, and a very objective method of uh, determining whether somebody's ovulating. Uh, now, if somebody's not ovulating regularly, uh, we have oral medications, Clomid you might've heard of. Uh, letrozole is another medication uh, that's out there, very similar uh, to Clomid. So these are very simple therapies uh, that uh, infertility experts can provide. Uh, and in occasional uh, circumstances, we actually might have to use injectable medications that contain the hormone FSH because that's what makes the eggs develop. Uh, but the majority of patients with ovulation problems will do well on these oral medications. For the tubal blockages, our main test here is called a hysterosalpingogram or HSG. And so we, uh, under uh, the x-ray machine, we inject this iodine-based dye. It fills up the inside of the uterus. So over here is an actual x-ray. So we see the inside of the uterus. We make sure the uterus looks normal. And then the dye should go in your fallopian tubes. Here's the right fallopian tube. And then here's the dye spilling out the right. Here's the left fallopian tube. And here's the dye spilling out the left. And so that makes sure that the uterus is normal, doesn't have any abnormalities in there, and it makes sure that both tubes uh, are open. Unfortunately, it does not show scar tissue that might be around the ovary, and it does not show uh, endometriosis, but it, it, it does show uh, whether the tubes are open or not. Now, for many couples that have mildly low sperm counts or mild endometriosis, or maybe one tube is blocked, uh, we use a therapy called superovulation, or another term for it is controlled ovarian hyperstimulation. But the idea here, here is to get the woman to ovulate two to four eggs a month instead of just the one that she normally produces. And so uh, again, we can use those oral drugs, Clomid or Letrozole, and we can combine that with an injectable trigger shot that actually makes those eggs to, uh, ovulate physically uh, two days after this trigger shot. Uh, and then we usually combine that uh, with this intrauterine insemination therapy, uh, which I'll show you slide in, in a second. But so the idea is to get two to four eggs developing in the ovaries, uh, here's an ultrasound picture. Those follicles are getting bigger. That means the eggs are getting mature. And to make those eggs ovulate, the tubes will normally pick them up uh, and then put the uh, washed sperm up inside the uterus. So we've got the sperm reaching, reaching those eggs. Uh, so that can be an effective therapy for, for many couples. Uh, intrauterine insemination, again, typically combined with that superovulation is taking the, the male's ejaculate and washing uh, the uh, fluid that comes out along with the sperm away from the sperm. It's a very noxious fluid. Uh, and then we reconcentrate uh, the really good sperm into a very small pellet of fluid, slide a little tiny catheter up into the uterus and deposit all that sperm up in the uterine cavity. We're not losing any sperm in the vagina. We're not losing any sperm penetrating the cervical mucus. So we've got much higher numbers of sperm. They still have to swim out in the fallopian tube because fertilization actually occurs way out here. Uh, we're giving them a, a big head start with the uh, intrauterine insemination or IUI. And then the ultimate therapy uh, that some couples need to go to, uh, but it's actually a minority, only about 5% of incur infertile couples ever end up with IVF, but it's there uh, and it's pretty much the most successful of, of all of our infertility techniques. Uh, and if you want uh, in, more information about infertility in general, but if you're considering IVF and you wanna know well, how successful will it be for me, if you go to the SART, Dot org. SART stands for the Society of Assisted Reproductive Technology, SART.org. There is a uh, button on there that you can plug in your age, you can plug in your AMH value and, and other values, and it would actually calculate based on U.S. data, so tens of thousands of other patients, and it will show you how successful uh, the average patient is in the United States. So a very valuable website to, to know. 
So with IVF, uh, we're using injectable FSH medications because we want the woman to produce 10 or 20 eggs, not just one or not just two to four, like with superovulation, but 10 to 20. And so again, um, as we're monitoring egg development, uh, they develop in these fluid-filled spaces called follicles. Here's a picture of the follicles. Uh, and when the follicles reach a certain size and the estrogen level reaches a certain uh, level, we know that the eggs inside of them, which we can't see, they're microscopic, we know they're mature. And we could put a vaginal ultrasound probe uh, and guide a needle into each one of those follicles. So here's the needle going into the follicle. We aspirate the fluid out and capture the fluid in a test tube and the egg comes with the fluid. So that's where the name test tube baby comes from. Uh, the embryologist then uh, isolates those eggs, fertilizes them in the laboratory, uh, and then we transfer the embryo. So this is what a mature egg actually looks like. So this is the actual egg cell, this big cell. It's actually the biggest cell in the body. All of these other cells surrounding uh, the egg, these are called uh, cumulus cells or granulosa cells. And they have been nourishing the egg uh, throughout its uh, development. Uh, but we wanna see uh, hopefully 10 or 20 of these uh, mature eggs. Now, if the male has a very low sperm count, uh, just adding the sperm to the same Petri dish with the eggs may not uh, achieve fertilization. So we might need to do this process called intracytoplasmic sperm injection or ICSI. So the embryologist picks up a single sperm. So this is an, a microscopic pipette here. This is another pipette just holding onto the egg. Uh, and this is the egg after all those other cells have been stripped away. And the embryologist can insert that pipette with the sperm inside of it directly into the cytoplasm uh, of the egg. Uh, and that will achieve fertilization about 70% of the time. And we also use this technique if the embryos are going to undergo genetic testing because we don't want other sperm in the area that might confuse the genetic uh, results. Uh, so uh, ICSI is sort of, of a subvariant of in vitro fertilization. Now, after we achieve fertilization, whether it's by just the, the putting sperm in the Petri dish or whether we have to do the ICSI process, we let the embryos grow uh, in the laboratory, in the special incubator uh, for five days. And at the end of five days, we're hoping to see embryos that look like this. This is called a blastocyst. And so this part of the embryo right here, this is what's gonna make the baby. This is called the inner cell mass. And all of these remaining cells out here will actually form the placenta. So here's a cartoon here. This is the inner cell mass and all of these cells actually form the placenta. They're called the trophoblast cells. And so we will uh, pick the healthiest looking blastocyst to transfer. And so five days after the eggs came out, we're gonna pick the best embryo. And the number of embryos to put back is guided by, uh, again, our parent societies, ASRM and SART. And so in general, women that are uh, less than age 38 will only have one embryo transferred at a time to achieve their maximal chance of pregnancy. And with IVF, remember I told you the average couple has a 15% chance of conception. Well, with IVF, we can actually achieve about a 45% chance of conception with this one embryo. Uh, and here is a picture of uh, sliding the little catheter up in the uterus. This is the uterus on ultrasound. And then depositing that embryo, this little white bright spot is a little droplet of fluid that's got the embryo contained within it. You can't see the embryo, it's microscopic, but, but it's within that little microscopic, uh, inside that uh, droplet. Now, if the woman is 38 to 40, typically we'll transfer two. And if she's over 30, will transfer three. And the reason we transfer more in older women is because the embryos are more likely to be chromosomally uh, abnormal and not result in a pregnancy. So we have to overcome that by just putting back more embryos. 
but these, these will achieve the optimal uh, range of uh, pregnancy in those age groups. So that's a quick look through um, what you should be thinking about when you're planning pregnancy, uh, things to make sure you're doing. And if you have problems achieving pregnancy, uh, things that your doctor will be looking uh, for uh, to help you out. So uh, I'll turn it back over to Marcia and we'll see what questions uh, people have. Perfect, thank you very much. That was very informative. Um, who knew that the largest cell in the body was uh, uh, an egg? <laughs> so we did get a couple questions that came in and if you have any more, please feel free to go ahead and submit them. Uh, but one of the questions that we received is, does depression and anxiety medications affect fertility or pregnancy? I'm planning to have a baby and I'm currently taking Buspar 20 milligrams a day, and I'm 32 years old. Can you talk about that? So, yeah, so antidepressant medications and anti anxiety medications, uh, some are safer than others. Uh, again, in general, you have to ask yourself and you have, need to ask your physician, you know, how badly do I need to be on this medication? Uh, can I do without it uh, for the next nine months? And if the answer is, well, you really do need to be on a medication, you need to work with your physician uh, to be on the safest uh, medication possible. Uh, actually, in our department, if, if your own physician has a question about what's the optimal antidepressant or uh, anti-anxiety drug to be on, we have a doubly boarded physician in our department who's not only an obstetrician, but she's actually a board certified psychiatrist and she's one of only a handful in the entire nation. And so she knows these medications backwards and forwards. So your physician could always uh, consult her uh, and see what, what's the optimal drug that I should be on. Okay, great, thank you. Um, my husband, here's another question. My husband takes a prescribed testosterone. My OBGYN said with a medical need, um, him not taking it could negatively impact our chances to conceive. Is this accurate? No, it's actually the opposite. So if he is take, if he is on testosterone injections and te testosterone patches or testosterone gel, he is adversely affecting his sperm count. So for sperm production to be normal, the testis has to make its own testosterone. And so when you're getting testosterone from the outside, it turns off the production of testosterone in the testis. And so sperm count drops. Uh, and so he definitely needs to come off of his testosterone therapy while he's trying to conceive uh, with, with his partner. Now, an alternative uh, in a few men that have severely low testosterone levels, an alternative uh, which most uh, primary physicians uh, won't know how to give is there's a hormone called HCG. It's the same hormone that we measure when women are pregnant, uh, but it mimics a, another hormone in men. And so men can actually take HCG injections twice a week, and that will boost their own testosterone production uh, without having to take testosterone from the outside. So he absolutely needs to come off of testosterone. Okay. Thank you. Um, we got a question about the um, receiving um, donor sperm process. Could you discuss that a little bit? How does that work? How? Um... So there are a number of uh, national sperm banks uh, that uh, have websites. You can uh, go online and look at these uh, sperm bank websites. For the most part, uh, the donors are anonymous. I think there are a couple now uh, where the donors are not anonymous but they do share all of the uh, family history of the donors, their personal medical history, uh, even some lifestyle things about their education level, et cetera. So, uh, and, and certainly their ethnicity and their uh, characteristics like hair color, eye color, that sort of thing. Uh, and so you, you pick out a donor, uh, you then with the help of your physician, her, uh, the donor samples, uh, their ship, to the treating clinic. Uh, and just like the slides I showed with the intra insemination, uh, when, the, when the woman is off, uh, we thaw out sperm sample that day. 
and do an intrauterine insemination with that thawed donor sperm. Okay. All right, great. Um, another question we received is, uh, does an AMH of less than one mean your only option is IVF? I'm 33, but I started my cycle at nine years old and I'm uh, worried about early, my early period might mean early menopause. Uh, early periods do uh, tend to mean early menopause, but it doesn't, we don't know, affect fertility at all. Uh, so certainly at 33, uh, you know, you, you are starting to lose some fertility, all 33 year olds are, but you're not in your mid to late 30s. So you still have plenty of time. Uh, now AMH has only been examined in infertile women. So women that we are having problems getting pregnant, all of the studies are looking at AMH in that population. It has not been looked adequately in the general population of women. So if you have never tried to conceive and just uh, had your physician check a random AMH level, we really don't know what that number means. We would assume it might mean if it's low, uh, it's not good news. Uh, but you know, if it's close to one and you're 33, then I don't think there is a major reason for concern if you haven't been trying to get pregnant. Okay. We have another question about genetic screenings. Um, in general, what screening should couples who are thinking of conceiving consider? You mentioned a few screening tests for those with a family or a medical history. So everyone should consider getting screened for cystic fibrosis and SMA, spinal muscular so those two for pretty much everybody, you should get screened. Um, you should, depending on your ethnicity, think about should you get sickle cell screening? Should you get screening for a thalassemia if you're of Mediterranean extraction or a Southeast Asian extract, extraction? Uh, and then again, if you have a family history of mental retardation, think about getting screened, screened for fragile X and then you can certainly consider if you want to be uh, on the extreme safe side, uh, you can uh, look at those expanded carrier screening panels. Uh, most of those companies will work with your insurance carrier. So your out of pocket expense is fairly minimal uh, if your uh, carrier uh, will cover those genetic screens. And most of them, in my experience, uh, have covered the vast majority of the cost of those uh, expanded carrier screens. Okay, that's good to know. I kind of wondered about that myself. Did um, insurance cover those? So uh, another question that came in is I'm 44 years old. My OBGYN says my body is healthy. We are trying to get pregnant. When should I stop and go to the, get uh, the treatment route and seek your guys' services? Yeah, 44 is almost a medical emergency in the infertility world. So uh, you know, if you um, have been trying more than probably three or four months, you probably need to seek help now uh, because uh, age uh, is really uh, not a, a friend of uh, fertility. Okay, good to know. Uh, another question that comes in, uh, does marijuana use in men affect fertility or pregnancy? I should have covered marijuana, but yes, uh, in men and women. Uh, marijuana is, uh, again, a direct toxin uh, to the eggs and to the sperm. Uh, it also affects hormone levels uh, in men and women. And so any significant marijuana use uh, is definitely adverse uh, for either partner. Okay. Uh, another question we, we received is, uh, on average, how many, how likely are you in the fertility process to conceive twins or a multiple pregnancy? Is that fairly common or is that diminished? Right, so uh, that depends on which therapy you are having. So with the oral medications, the Clomid and the Letrozole, if you get pregnant on those medications, uh, you have about a five to 8% chance of twins. It's rare to have more than twins, but it's a higher risk than if you conceived without those medications. If you are receiving the injectable medications outside of IVF, 
the risk now goes up to about a 15 to 20 percent chance of twins and about a 5 percent chance of triplets, quadruplets, etc. So that's the riskiest. And inside the setting of IVF, that is the one setting where we can actually control best the multiple pregnancy rate because we control how many embryos we choose to put back. And that's why in women who are less than 38 years old, we only put back one embryo. So we are, for the most part, eliminating any chance of multiple pregnancy. Okay. Um, well, I don't have any more questions that have come at this time. So I uh, appreciate your time that you took to give this talk tonight and give all the information to everyone. And I thank you guys for who attended and there'll be a survey that will pop up. So I'd love for you guys to let us know what you thought about things today. And again, Dr. Williams, I can't thank you enough for your time this evening. All right. Thank you. It was enjoyable. Thank you.